I think, especially yeah. in the Theravada tradition, impermanence seems to be really something that's um, a real key to a lot of these insights. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. Uh, in fact, I was just reading a, a one one part of the you know from the teaching from the text where the Buddha said. Um, Uh, this is a paraphrase, I don't remember exactly, but it was through seeing of impermanence, um, one comes to realize non-self because everything is, <laughs> nothing is lasting long enough to be self. You know, so, so impermanence becomes the doorway to seeing non-self. And then he went on to say, in seeing non-self, one eliminates the conceit I am. You know, and when one eliminates the conceit I am, one realizes or attains Nibbana, you know, the highest peace. So impermanence uh, is a doorway and an understandable doorway, you know, to realizing non-self and then liberation. Because for many people, the idea of non-self is very confusing. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's it's counterintuitive to our common sense understanding of ourselves. You know, what do you mean there's no self? <laughs> you know, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. And so and we can, you know, talk about it and describe it and hopefully, you know, help people to come to an understanding of it. But impermanence is readily, that, that's easily understandable, even if we don't always act on that wisdom. But it's not difficult to understand. And so I think it becomes a very accessible doorway to liberating wisdom. And I think the, um, the concept of emptiness um, seems to be, at least from what I've seen, seems to be less emphasized in the Theravada tradition than in, in Mahayana. Is that fair to say? Uh, I think not exactly, because emptiness, in my understanding, the way that term is used and in, in Pali and Sanskrit is chunyata, you know, it's emptiness. And that's found. There, there are some suttas in the Pali Canon on shunyata, on emptiness. Uh, generally, within the Theravada school, emptiness is really synonymous with non-self. Right. So it's very much emphasized. I mean, that's, that's key to the whole teaching. In my understanding of Mahayana and Vajrayana teachings, emptiness means that but also it has a more extended meaning that nothing has any uh, intrinsic self-existence. Not only, not only this mind body is you know, empty of self, but everything, you know, all phenomena have no uh, intrinsic self-existence, meaning that everything that arises arises out of conditions. You know? And so everything is contingent. Uh, so there was one Sri Lankan monk who's quite, quite a famous uh, meditator, scholar. He had a phrase which just resonated with me. He said, uh, everything is circumstantial, not substantial. You know, and so it's just, it, uh, so even, even this understanding of emptiness is found within the Theravada, you know, that everything is contingent, contingent upon causes. Right, yeah. Um, and yeah. the... The, I guess this relates to the doctrine of two truths. It's a similar idea to the, there being the, the kind of the relative and then the absolute or the ultimate. Yeah. yeah. In, in, the, in Mahayana, uh, that description of the two truths is very explicit. As far as I know, those terms are not so widely used, you know, in the Pali Canon, but the meaning is embedded in the teachings, you know, because... Uh, yeah, and in some way they talk about conventional reality and more ultimate reality. So I guess, yeah, it's a very similar teaching, um, even though the, you don't find the phrase, the two truths, very much right. in, in Theravada. But, but the essence is there, definitely. So I guess people who maybe might struggle with the idea that, that the self isn't what we think it is, I, I think it can, can be sometimes useful to think in these ways when communicating it, because you're not, if you say, you know, the concept James 
exists relative to you and that it's useful. If someone wants to say James or Joseph, those, are, those terms are useful to point to this person or that person relative to each other, right? So there is something that exists in that relative way, but it's convention. It's not, there is no substance or, or thing that exists that is James, right, in an absolute sense. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's, there's an image that has come to mind recently, which um, I, th I think may, you know, help people to understand this, what non-self really means, because it's often confused. You know, people hear that phrase and they may think, oh, when you realize non-self, <laughs> suddenly you disappear in a cloud of smoke right. or something. <laughs> you know, so it's obviously not like that. So the image that I've been using recently, uh, you know, if, if you're outside, you know, and you're hiking and maybe you, you know, come to the side of a river, a river bank, and you're just sitting, you know, looking at the river. So then you might, if, if one was so inclined, well, what is a river? You know, what is a river? So a river is a concept, it's a designation for this flow of water, you know, shaped by topography. So, you know, every river will look different, the speed of the water will be different, the contours will be different. But it's not as if that flow of water belongs to something called a river. River is simply the designation for the flow of water. You know? So self is like river. You know, self and river is a useful concept. You know, so we can talk about you know, the Mississippi River or the Amazon River so we know what we're talking about. But that doesn't make river as being some uh, substantial entity other than a designation for a flow, a particular flow of water. Uh, and so we use self or Joseph, you know, in just that way. That those terms are a designation for the flow of the mind-body process. Uh, so I think, I don't know if that made sense to you. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think it might help people understand really what non-selfless selflessness <laughs> means, because it's it's very often misunderstood. Right, and and in the way you said that in the Theravada tradition, emptiness and selflessness are sometimes kind of I guess uh, maybe used yeah. in a close way, like I, synonymous. What you just yeah. described, exactly. Yeah, what you described, I would say, it like you know, the river doesn't have essence of river, but because the self is effectively believing that there's essence of James. I, I see, you know, why that uh, you know, emptiness would just be, nothing has any intrinsic essence of anything, um, including, right, including right. the self, right? To say that the particular flow, whether it's of water, you know, uh, or of this just mind-body process, doesn't belong to anyone to whom it's happening, that what we call self is the flow, but it's also to acknowledge that each mind-body flow uh, is unique because each of the elements, you know, are conditioned in different ways. And that's why the concept river or the concept James or Joseph is helpful because, you know, we can designate different flows, you know, which is why you and I and everybody are individuals in that sense but it's only a description of the pattern of the flow. Right. And so you mentioned that, that there's this, with, with the self, there's this um, feeling of the experience belonging to someone, right? This, this thing of right. these are James's, like James is seeing, or, or these are James's experiences. And that I guess the insight, a, a part of the insight is realizing that that's entirely additional, right? There's just the experience. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But but as as you said, it has a it has a usefulness, you know, right. to be able to call it James or Joseph. But it doesn't it doesn't really refer to anything other than the particular patterns of the of the flow of the mind body elements, you know. And your patterns are different than my patterns, you know. And, uh, is this podcast going to be just audio or also visual? Uh, both. It'll be both versions. Okay, so I, I, wanted to, I wanted to give a little visual illustration. <laughs> uh, so to, usually we think of all experience referring back to, 
to a self, to me. Okay, I'm the one who's having the experience. And that's our usual way of operating in the world. The understanding of selflessness is not that it refers back to anyone, but rather that all experience is like this. So the experience is exactly the same. You know, it's not denying the truth of what's arising, but instead of it referring back to anyone, it is just what it is. And so each moment is this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. Uh, and so that's what it means that there's no one to whom it refers, but that does not negate the experience. The experience remains the same. I, this this may be a, a kind of tricky thing to try to articulate, but I, I wonder, is how do you think of the relationship to clinging and the illusion of the self? Because they seem to be deeply related, but it's a kind of complex way, yeah. I guess. Well, uh, so one... Um, are there, I'd say there are two two levels of this that come to mind. So one level is where we're clinging to the idea or the concept of self. We're clinging, we're clinging to the view that there is a self. And this is pretty common. I mean, this, this is how most people are moving through the world, you know, with a strong uh, attachment to the view. Yes, that, that there's a, there's a you know, unchanging Joseph in here, you know, to whom experience is happening. So that's one level of clinging. But on another more, um, I would say momentary level, rather than use the word clinging, I find it more helpful to describe it in terms of uh, being identified with phenomena. And so a thought arises and the habit is to be identified with the thought or a sensation identified with a sensation or an emotion. You know, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm excited, I'm thinking, I'm walking. You know, and so we identify with whatever the experience is. But that identification is extra. You know, and one of the powers of mindfulness meditation is that we practice being with experience without that added aspect of being identified with it. Uh, so I find, I just find that notion of identification with something which is it really is another way of expressing clinging but it seems to me to to highlight the actual process in the mind of how this sense of this the felt sense of self is created 